everyone. Welcome to today's webinar discussing revascularization strategies in STEMI and multivessel disease with a special focus on the role of physiology. It's my privilege to be here together with Joel Pirot from Hungary and Peter Smith from the Netherlands. The, uh, the uh, plan for today, so the objectives for today will be to discuss with you um, um, uh, based on two clinical cases presented by Jolt and by Peter, uh, we will discuss with you um, what are the current uh, strategies in, in uh, STEMI and multivessel disease, what is the role of physiology, how far we can use, how far we should use um, uh, physiology in guiding the treatment of, uh, of uh, bystander lesions, and we will also discuss uh, the advantages of the obstetrics pressure guide wire technology uh, uh, supporting the safe and reliable assessment of non carpet infarct related uh, artery stenosis. As you have seen in the agenda, that um, we will start with the, uh, with the brief introduction, but then we will more focus on real clinical cases coming from Hungary and from the Netherlands. And please don't forget that this should be an interactive session. So your participations are most welcome. Um, you should have a chat panel below the screen. So please post your questions, your comments. We will do our best to address all of them uh, during uh, this session uh, between the cases and at the end of, of, of uh, uh, the webinar. So, before we start, I would like to also thank the support of Opsons um, to make this session come true. And of course, uh, also the support of Radcliffe Cardiology by, by providing us the platform for this webinar. So let's start first with a brief uh, introduction on, uh, on complete revascularization strategy in STEMI and multivessel disease. Is it necessary? Or, or is it just one way to go from many others? And actually, I would say that uh, we have already good clinical data supporting the advantage of complete revascularization in multivessel disease uh, STEMI patient, starting from the PRAMI trial from uh, 2013, showing a clear advantage for complete revascularization. Um, in this case, uh, it was with NGO guidance. And a few years later, in the, uh, in the complete trial, it was confirmed on a much larger cohort uh, with more than uh, 2,000 patients in, in both groups. And very recently, a meta-analysis was published uh, um, summing all the, all the recent trials comparing complete versus infarct only uh, strategies, again, being confirmatory that complete revascularization should be the standard of care in STEMI multivessel disease. Now the question is that how to guide uh, the revascularization? How can we decide which bystander lesion should be treated or should be left for medical therapy? Here I would like to refer to a, we can already say it's a quite old try, uh, study from more than 10 years ago from from uh, the ALS group showing that FFR guidance is actually reliable for the non carpet lesions even during the acute event. There was always a lot of discussion whether you can, you, whether you can do FFR guidance or not, whether it's reliable, vessels might be spastic, you cannot reach maximum hyperemia. But this, trial, this study showed actually very nicely that the FFR, what you measure in the acute setting, it's actually um, uh, uh, the same value as what you uh, can measure later on in the non carpet region. So very important message, don't forget this or remember this from this webinar, FFR for the non carpet is a reliable measurement even during the acute setting. And this was <coughs> confirmed on a larger scale um, uh, showing that uh, if you use FFR guided revascularization of the non carpet, it's it, is it, it is advantageous as compared to if infarct-related revascularization alone. Now the, the question remains whether it's better to do NGO-guided or it's better to do FFR-guided complete revascularization. Still, 
I would say this question is still open. I'm happy to have here our, our, our faculty and we will definitely discuss this later on. Uh, during this webinar, which should be the strategy and the other one. So um, now the question remains that what is the best timing for complete revascularization? Shall we do it ad hoc? Shall we do it uh, stage after a few days or stage a bit later on? Here, uh, the question is open. It's an open debate. Many things to be considered. Clinical, clinical um, characteristics of the patient, cat lab logistics, hospital logistics, and financial consideration. And I can tell you, we'll spend a lot of time during this webinar discussing this, uh, this aspect from Netherlands point of view, Hungarian point of view, and I hope with all your comments from the chat panel. So with this introduction of the theoretical, or let's say the research background, I would like to immediately hand it over to Joel to bring up his case. And uh, I would like to also emphasize one more for the audi audience, look at the chat panel below, post your questions. We will do our best to answer all of them. Joel? Yeah, but thank you very much. It was a very nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to participate in this uh, webinar. I would like to present a case uh, using OptoWire in a patient with acute STEMI. But before we uh, embark on this, I'd like to have a poll and please uh, make your uh, voice be heard in this. You have five options uh, to answer this question. What is your current practice in the management of multivessel disease STEMI patients? If you treat the culprit only, please click on A. If you completely revascularize the patient angio-guided at the end of the procedure, so you're an aggressive angio-guided guy, please click on B. If you do uh, the complete angio-guided revascularization in a staged manner, please choose C. If you do the complete revascularization, revascularization physio-guided, physiology-guided in a staged manner, please click on D. And if you use physiology guidance for complete revascularization at the index procedure, so you did all in one, but physiology guided, please choose E. So please choose one of the five options. And you have all the time during my presentation to choose one of your uh, answers. So with that, let's go to my case. It's on a 59 year old female who, whose past medical history was only positive for a cholecystectomy. She has no known risk factors of coronary artery disease and she was taking no medications whatsoever at the time of admission. She presented to an emergency department with a chest pain of two hours of duration, whereupon the ECG showed inferior ST segments elevation myocardial infarction. As per local practice, she was loaded with 250 milligrams of aspirin, 600 milligrams of clopidogrel, and 5,000 units of heparin intravenously. You can discuss that also. Um, she was immediately ter uh, transferred to a tertiary care hospital, whereupon she was rushed to the cath lab for a transradial cornea angiography. This is to show you the right coronary artery, the dominant right is thrombotically occluded, consistent with the ST segment elevation in the inferior leads, which you're able to see in the same panel. But as in the case of about 30 to 50% of, of the patients uh, uh, taken for primary PCI, she also has some lesions in the left coronary system, so elsewhere, she's a multivessel disease patient. She has an angiographically significant LAD lesion in the mid LAD and also uh, a circumflex lesion. So of course, there's no question what the first step should be. It was primary right coronary PCI. We performed transradially using a six French guiding catheter, uh, we used a guiding workhorse uh, wire and a balloon. And after opening the vessel, we found a very large thrombus burden. So she was uh, given aptifibatide intravenously. Then thereafter, she has placed two long drug eluting stents, a 3.5 by 33 millimeter and a 4.0 by 15 millimeter everolimus eluting stent. And thereby we were able to establish TIMI3 flow when uh, uh, the thrombus resolved. And also we noted a complete ST segment resolution and she became pain-free and she was uh, stable hemodynamically. So this is to show you the results of the right coronary PCI, good flow in all the uh, side branches, and also you can appreciate the resolution of the ST segment elevation. So the considerations in our case were the following. We performed uh, the successful right coronary primary PCI with TIMI3 flow and hemodynamic stability. 
Uh, we spent only uh, a couple of minutes doing so and using only 120 millimeters of contrast for the angiography and the PCI. And the patient tolerated the procedure very well, which is very important to, to uh, emphasize because all the trials and all the evidence that we have, of course, pertain to such patients. But on the other hand, she has three vessel disease. And importantly, uh, and as a housekeeping remark, there was actually no acute other patient on the list. So we had the time to go on if we chose to. But on the other hand, we had to consider the fact that there is no reimbursement for anything else we do in this case. So I just stop here for a second uh, and would like to have uh, your ideas, Peter and Gabo, what you would do in such a case and how you uh, behave and how you handle these cases. Um, yeah, Zolt, a um, very nice case uh, and very interesting case. And, and I agree, it's a very common case that we are often confronted with to have a multifessal STEMI patient. Um, as you mentioned, it's something between ranging between 30 and 50% of all our STEMI patients. So it's quite a, a frequent um, case that we have to treat those patients. Um, you, uh, I think what's really important in the decision making is uh, what you already mentioned. Uh, the, the, the procedure went very smooth and complicated. Uh, the patient was stable, and um, and um, and and you have on the left side um, it appears on angi angiographically quite severe lesions, um, um, significant lesions, if I may say so, um, and, and but not very complex lesions. Uh, there no, at least no bifurcations, no very long lesions, um, and no real uh, tortuosity or very calcified uh, vessels. So I think those factors really um, I would take into account for my decision-making, whether I would proceed um, doing a complete revascularization um, or aim at the complete revascularization uh, at the spot, at, at the index uh, procedure or not. And uh, looking at your case, I think I would, um, and specifically if it was also in, in daytime or something, not in the middle of the night, I would, I would think I would proceed going over to the left and try to help this uh, lady uh, on the spot uh, complete as possible. And, um, and I believe that FFR is a good way of assessing those lesions, whether they, they shouldn't need to be treated or not. And I think I would do FFR in those cases uh, anyhow. And, and uh, based on the FFR results, I would treat the uh, LED or not and, and the circumflex. Um, yep. Um, based on the FFR measurements. So I think that would that are my considerations. Maybe Gabor, you have... The, no, I, actually, I fully agree with uh, your comments, especially in the mean that you mentioned no other patient is waiting. Uh, it's not when it's not the time when the cat lab team is already fully exhausted after five other cases, then I think this aspect has to be also considered before you go on. And again, as you say, the patient tolerated very well the, uh, the, uh, the treatment of the culprit and the non-culprits are not uh, very complex. Uh, so this means I fully agree with your approaches, but I would like to uh, give you already two questions from the, poll, from, the, uh, from the chat panel because some colleagues are asking and actually both questions are linked together. So is when you decide for FFR guidance, as let's say we already agreed, uh, is it better to use IV adenosine, IC adenosine, or you would suggest one of the non-hyperemic indices? Or you just use what you are familiar with? Well, if I may take the question, I think, uh, I think the best answer is, is, is uh, for as far as the uh, IC or IV is concerned, whatever you're familiar with, whatever your normal regular practices, please do use it. Because, of course, it's a somewhat stressful situation. You already did something to this patient. She's in, or in this patient is in STEMI, and, and you want to make it as quick and as smooth as possible. So you should probably stick to your best practice. Um, we have um, data from outcome trials like the Veracute, but if I may just move on a little because I have slides to support that. So if you could um, show the, the next slide, please. Um, what is the available evidence? 
So um, we have three approaches, uh, as already stated by Gabor. We have the conservative infarct-related artery-only approach, the conservative old school. We only treat the infarct-related artery and leave everything uh, alone on medication. Or we may go very aggressive. We may treat everything in one go, or we may choose a stage procedure. And both can be either NGO or physiology-guided. Uh, the uh, two trials of the five that you mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, Dynamic 3 Promulti and the Comparacu trial both used FFR. So we have evidence for FFR in this respect. We do not yet have large scale non hyperemic uh, index based uh, uh, outcome trial in multivessel disease uh, stay, uh, STEMI patients. We have small uh, uh, um, cohorts and, and small pu um, publications and smaller uh, groups of patients. So the best available evidence is on FFR. So I, I would go for this. Uh, we are actually um, interested in, in knowing whether or not uh, non hyperemic indices can be used uh, as well. But uh, up until now, the available evidence shows that the, re the reproducibility of non hyperemic indices in the acute phase versus uh, staged or later on uh, stage uh, uh, is less uh, good as compared to the FFR. So both the uh, uh, um, uh, Dynamic 3 Primulti and also the Compare Acute Trial which was actually pioneered and, and led by Peter Smith uh, uh, with us today, uh, show the superiority of the complete revascularization in terms of uh, uh, myocardial infarction and target vessel revascularization free survival. We did some uh, sub-analysis based on the, uh, on the uh, comparative trial to show and to see how FFR actually behaves. And we could see that the, the patients in whom the non corporate lesion was treated medically and you, as you remember, uh, in all the uh, non corporate lesions, the FFR was measured in the comparative trial, but was blinded. The, the treating physicians were blinded to them. And therefore, the management of the patients in this cohort was left to the discretion of the treating physician not knowing the FFR. So the FFR value, if it was lower than 0 0.80, the outcome of the patient was significantly worse as compared with anything above that, which again is an indirect uh, proof that FFR behaves much like in chronic chronic syndrome in STEMI patients in the non culprits So we can actually use the same old uh, cutoff of 0.80. So in this case, to answer your question, I would go for an FFR. And most of the cases we use IC adenosine, but if you're an IV adenosine user, I think you're, you're absolutely perfectly, used, uh, perfectly fine with IV. Uh, of course, you may uh, have to consider uh, the hemodynamic effects of, of, of adenosine, but if you give IC adenosine, it only lasts for a couple of seconds, really does not usually uh, uh, do anything uh, more, than, more long lasting than that. And of course, we are not talking about patients in shock or, or patients in whom the primary PCI failed, because these were exclusion criteria in all the trials that we actually have on board. So the evidence pertains to patients who had a successful primary PCI and are stable. Does it answer your question? Or do you have anything that to, to, to add before I move on? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's answered the question, but uh, then I, I would like to point to you immediately at the next question from the chat panel. Uh, the colleague is asking uh, or saying that um, the, the data from Dalianis is often debated. Uh, and the question is, um, um, uh, whether FFR is reliable if measured before patient is fully stabilized or the other way around, should not be the patient first fully stabilized and just after measure, um, measure FFR. Are the data good enough now showing that in an acute setting, uh, the FFR is a reliable value? Well, of course, uh... The more evidence we have, the more certain we are that, that we are, this is the way to go. We have small pieces of evidence and we have the picture now being filled with these uh, small bits. And now, um, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, like this, the Daniel's paper is on 112 patients uh, in whom uh, there is no significant difference between the, the, the FFR measured during the acute phase as compared with a uh, later phase. But uh, we see that more and more as in, in our daily practice, uh, and, and I think uh, there is some, some growing evidence in the literature, but of course we have no outcome trial with 2,000 patients measured in both acutely and say six weeks later in their non copies to see that the, the FFR did not change. 
Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I, I'm wondering what uh, Peter thinks about that. But my imper interpretation, or let's say my interpretation of this debate was always there that uh, this is a range of patients in terms of uh, hemodynamic stability. You know, one end in the cardiogenic shock where we would probably never measure FFR, and the other end is a very stable patient. And there is a range in between. So it's probably it's difficult to define where we say that this patient is already a fully vagal and maybe we don't want to uh, give nitro adenosine and so on and, and where it starts when we can call this patient a fully stable one. So indeed, I think uh, these data are coming from patients who are really the, the absolutely stable uh, STEMI patients. Uh, where it starts to be called not fully stable patient, I think this is what might be difficult to define. Peter? Um, well, it's <clears throat> not only the study of Natalianis um, investigated the, the value of FFR um, in the acute setting and at the staged setting. Natalianis uh, looked at indeed at 112 patients, uh, not all STEMI, but also some non-STEMI patients. Um, and indeed, on average, did not notice um, a difference at, one, uh, at index compared to one month's follow-up. Um, um, However, you can see some individual changes. Um, but there are more studies than this one of Natalis. There's also one study done by Musto, an Italian cardiologist, who looked at uh, in the acute phase and that repeat the, the same FFR and IFR uh, in STEMI, multifacial STEMI patients at two weeks follow up. And there's an, um, um, a Korean study from Lee uh, also sh doing a comparative study at index and at later on. And uh, also a Dutch study from Van der Hoeven also looked at FFR and CFR. Um, um, but on average, uh, not on average, but three of the four studies that I mentioned all showed that there is quite a reliability that the real, real, reliability of FFR um, at two weeks or one month after the um, uh, STEMI is very reliable um, 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 compared to at what you measure at index. Only Van der Hoeve um, um, in uh, EMC noticed uh, some uh, differences at follow-up, um, and that was largely uh, that for uh, that difference was largely uh, in large anterior wall MI infarction patients, and that I think you that I think you may have to take to in, into account if you have a really large anterior wall MI. Your hemodynamics might be changed. Your 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 adrenaline uh, uh, drive is 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 higher, probably higher, and that might um, influence your FFR measurement in the non-era. Okay, thank you. I would suggest you to to go on with Joel's case and let's see uh, what you found here, and then we will still have plenty of time to discuss. So, what we did is is used an OptoWire three. And uh, we actually placed it in the distal part of the LAD, gave nitro. That gave us a PDPA ratio, a resting PDPA ratio of 0.77, which is, of course, consistent with a hemodynamically significant lesion. But we, all, we were also to, uh, keen to see the, uh, the uh, true FFR. So we gave IC adenosine as per local practice, 200 mics, and arrived at an FFR of 0.74. And using the same wire, just like any normal workhorse wire, uh, we placed this 30 by 80 millimeter evaluating saluting stent in the LAD, and thereafter we're able to measure the post PCA FFR, which we think is of high hemodynamic importance and prognostic significance. Uh, the PDPA ratio, resting P, resting if you may say so, after a, a PCI was 0.87, and the post PCA FFR up to 200 micrograms of adenosine given intercoronarily was 0.85. So thereby, we were able to show that the LAD was indeed hemodynamically significant. We were able to treat it using the same wire. We did not have to exchange it. We could use it as a workforce wire. And it also allowed us to measure the post pcffr And then we moved to the uh, circumflex. We placed the wire in the distal part of the large marginal. Uh, and uh, after giving IC uh, nitro, the PDP ratio was 0.86, but the FFR was non-significant at 0.85. So we were quite confident to leave that uh, circumflex lesion alone. And uh, so in this case, we had uh, the possibility of completely and functionally revascularize this inferior STEMI patient with multivessel disease in one stage, which I think is somewhat important for uh, the COVID pandemic we are facing. 
Um, that's another maybe a uh, consideration point that we may take into account. Uh, the FFR measurement clearly indicated the functional significance and relevance of the LAD and also uh, allowed us to defer the circumflex marginal revascularization. Of note, this patient needs no further ischemia testing and needs no further uh, hospitalization or no repeat hospitalization for completion of revascularization, which now is the standard. The optowire could be used as a workhorse wire and it also made it possible to assess the post-PCFFR without any drift, which is of course very important. So technically it's uh, uh, something that allow us to do even more complex procedures and multi-vessel uh, uh, PCIs with a post-PCFFR measurement. So with that, I conclude my case and would like to have in the next uh, uh, slide, the results of the poll. So uh, actually 39% uh, uh, of the colleagues answered E, which means complete revascularization uh, uh, guided by physiology during the index uh, uh, procedure, so during primary PCI. So it's the compare acute ap ap approach, a physiology guided but aggressive multivessel uh, PCI approach. The second most prevalent answer was to, uh, A, treat culprit only. A third of the colleagues answered this. 17% answered uh, they do complete revascularization by angel guidance in a stage manner. And 11% uh, of the colleagues answered uh, that they do staged physiology guided complete revascularization. So in all two thirds of the colleagues perform uh, complete revascularization and the majority uses physiology during the index uh, procedure and the remaining uh, are due at, uh, in a staged manner. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Very interesting findings of the, uh, of the poll, I would say. Um, and uh, let me just give you again uh, uh, two questions uh, relatively linked together from the, from the chat. Colleagues are asking whether you find already the evidence uh, strong enough to support um, uh, FFR uh, guided complete revascularization. And they are asking whether there is any data supporting that it improves prognosis. Probably um, I can ask this question to Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, whether it improves prognosis, um, um, not so much on mortality. Um, um, there, therefore, we have not the data. Uh, the trials that we did looked at FFR or physiology guided complete revascularization were not powered enough to, to look at mortality uh, per se. Um, so um, in that respect, I, I cannot answer that um, for certain. Um, what, we, what we can say is what we have seen so far is that if the non-infarct related arteries have um, a negative FFR, uh, meaning of above 0.80, um, they have a relatively r benign um, 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 benign um, uh, follow-up, uh, meaning there's, those lesions are not prone to have to, to result in myocardial infarction at the, at the, at the follow-up, and we have looked up, up to, to three years, and um, and that is um, quite reassuring that those lesions actually behave quite well. It actually, almost similar like in the deferred trial, um, deferred study in the stable and uh, in the chronic uh, coronary syndrome arena. Um, what about, what do you think, uh, Zolt? Do you think uh, that, that um, is there any benefit of prognosis? I don't think we have, you already mentioned that compared to angio guided, we have not, um, we, have, we are still awaiting the results from the trial that is comparing ever guided versus um, angio guided, um, complete, um, that is still open. Um, so what, what is your yeah, this, this This trial actually may have come to a halt after the publication of the complete trial, if I'm not mistaken. What we know uh, is uh, we have five trials, four of which are uh, too small to assess prognosis and all included revascularization among the, the endpoint, the primary endpoint. It was only complete to, uh, uh, to have the primary endpoint only cardiovascular deaths and myocardial infarctions, and that was uh, positive. But we also should see the meta-analyses of these uh, uh, trials 
and they all uh, point uh, um, together uh, to a reduction of myocardial infarction related to, uh, uh, re uh, to the revascularization of the non -corporates. So I think what we, as far as prognosis is concerned, most probably uh, mortality uh, is not, has not been shown to be decreased by the non cooperative vascularization. But uh, the non-fatal non myocardial infarctions related to the non carpets have been both uh, in one single, um, mostly angio-guided trial, the complete trial, and also shown by the meta-analyses. So I think that's that's a pretty good point because of course if you if you only reduce later vascularizations one may say that okay you did it in one go in the first uh, place, but it's also important to see uh, what is uh, the pa percentage of patients coming with an acute chest pain needing acute revascularization as compared with a, a planned revascularization which of course is a more relaxed manner and has a better prognosis and I think we have pretty good um, I mean least hints from these trials that acute revascularizations related to the non carpets are reduced if we do it uh, early on. The benefit of physiology guidance is the reduction of stents needed. So in the Denami 3 Primulti, 31% of the non carpet lesions, which were thought uh, 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 angiography significant, were hemodynamically non-significant, and this percentage was 50% in the, in the Comparacute trial. So, and we know even from old uh, angio-guided uh, studies that everything looks worse during the acute phase of STEMI. So this is, I think, where, where physiology comes into play, uh, into play to help us sort out which lesions to be treated or which can be deferred safely. Yeah, Jörg, it's a very good point. And with this one, you already answered uh, one of the next questions on the chat panel. He, the colleagues is asking uh, which uh, lesions benefit uh, the most from uh, FFR guidance. And I think, I believe that, as you said, uh, at least one third to 50% of the lesions look significant and turn to be non-significant. So I think the ones who benefit the most are the complex procedures, but you can avoid by proving that it's unnecessary. So all the unnecessary complex procedures, what you can avoid by FFR guidance, these are probably the real benefit for, for our patients. And then one question again, uh, which is a bit, let's stepping uh, aside from, uh, from the... Um, from the uh, uh, FFR guidance per se is where is your contrast use limit for the culprit when you still decide, okay, we can still go on and, 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 uh, and let's see what uh, the non-culprits are doing. You state here the patient, for your patient, you use 120 for the, for the culprit. It's, uh, it's probably a good average, but where you would say, okay, it was just enough. And if you say it was just enough, what is the day when you Say we can do the second procedure. Yeah, this is a uh, nice question. Sorry, Sorry go you go ahead. So, uh, yeah, no, you go ahead okay, well, it's a nice question because uh, when you're dealing with STEMI patients, you often don't know the renal function of those patients, and and uh, and so it's always good to limit as much as possible your your, your contrast load. Um, I don't have a fixed. Uh, fixed amount of contrast that I, uh, that, I, that I would stop at a certain moment, but I definitely will take it in, into, account, into, into account of my decision making. But I think in total, if you are spending maybe 300 milliliters of contrast, I think that's still okay. Um, um, and, and, and don't be afraid that measuring only an FFR is not adding more than 10 ml uh, of contrast um, um, in, in average, uh, I think, and, 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 and doing additional PCI is, is not adding that much contrast if it is at least not complex. Yeah, I think this is also a very good point because it's two different things to, to assess the FFR of a lesion and really go into the procedure. So I would say that even in case of more complex look, looking lesions, what we sometimes consider, okay, we assess it now with FFR. If it's non-significant, the patient doesn't need to come back. If it turns to be significant, then on the next day or the one after, we know exactly that this lesion has to be treated. So in this way, we still have the chance that we spare another procedure. And when the patient needs, really needs to come for a second procedure, we know exactly what we have to do. Absolutely, I cannot agree more. And I think uh, we have to uh, emphasize the fact that FFR measurement is really safe. So out of the 1,300 FFR measurements in the non carpets in the Comparacute trial, there are only two dissections which could be treated. Uh, so 
it's really not different from what we see in everyday practice. And I myself wouldn't be able to give an exact figure for the, for the contrast amount. But we also have to consider the amount of contrast which will probably be needed for, for the non carpet vascularization. So most probably we would never embark on anything needing rotablation or, or CTO revascularization in the non carpets. We have no evidence to show that this, this has any benefit. What's more, it's most probably deleterious. Okay, with this message, I would suggest that we move on to the next case from, from the Netherlands. Thank you, uh, Gabor. Um, well, I have a kind of similar case. It's an FFR and a STEMI case with multivessel disease um, that I would like to show you. Um, let me see if I can forward the slide. Um, yeah. Um, but first of all, um, I think it's maybe of interest to, to have this poll and um, in an interventional decision making for multivessel STEMI patients, would you change your attitude if the FFR wire was reimbursed within the STEMI procedure? Um, I'm raising that question because in some countries, FFR is not reimbursed for uh, ACS patients. And, um, and it, would be, it would be interesting to see if if the FFR was reimbursed within ACS patients or for instance in your STEMI, multivessel STEMI patient, would that change your attitude to attitude or your strategy? And the second B is if the FFR wire was reimbursed at the stage procedure, it's not at the, only at the index procedure, but also if the FFR was reimbursed at the stage procedure. Um, and then as last question C, if complete revascularization at the STEMI procedure was higher reimbursed than infarct related artery only treatment. I know, and that is, that is um, for instance, for the Netherlands, is that is the situation is that when you treat a STEMI patient, you get one price. If you treat one lesion or you treat three lesions, if you do it ever for guided or not, you only get one price. Um, the hospital is only reimbursed for one price. Um, whereas in some countries like Sweden and in Poland, they changed that attitude. They changed based on the, re on the trials. They said, if you do a complete resuscitation at index, we, re we will reimburse you higher. Uh, so we will prevent staged procedures. So I was wondering, would that um, for our audience, would that change your strategy if complete resuscitation at STEMI procedure was higher reimbursed than, than if you were doing only infarct artery only treatment? Well, please uh, put out your poll. I'm happy to hear the results after the, my presentation. Um, let me continue with the case. In this case, it's a male patient, 59 year old, uh, with a history of a PCI of the mid LED in, in, the, in the past, known with diabetes type 2, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. And very recently, last week, Thursday, he was called, um, uh, he called the ambulance because of severe acute chest pain. And based on the symptoms and EKG that was transmitted to the hospital, it was decided to, to upload that patient with a heparin, 5,000 international units, uh, and uh, preload the patient with Ticagolor 180, and also received um, 300 milligrams of aspirin. Um, and then this is the EKG that was transmitted by the telephone to the hospital for decision making, what to do with this patient and the, the doctor on call accepted this patient for primary PCI based on some elevations, as you can see on the, on the, um, on the yeah, mainly on the lateral uh, leads. Um, this is the uh, angio at the right, uh, not that big, um, actually more, I think it's going to be a left dominant system if I look at this right. Uh, moderate disease in the middle, um, a little bit intermediate, but angiographically I would not say that it, was, it would be less than 50%. This year, the left coronary artery, uh, where you can see the clear culprit lesion, the uh, intermediate branch um, has, a, has a almost occluded uh, slow flow in the um, TME2 flow, um, as you can see here. The postolateral branch has some long lesion disease, starting from the osteol. The LED, you don't see that well that much, um, but maybe you can appreciate it over here. There is the stent of 2015, and just proximal of the stent, you see um, an eccentric, um, mo uh, moderate uh, lesion. Um, and here you can see better the long looking, maybe just um, 
significant lesion in the posolateral branch uh, of the circumflex. And you can see it's a left dominant system. This is the LED um, uh, projected in the cranial projection. If I can move it, can, can, I, can we... Can we have the movie? Can we? Can you click on the? Yeah, here it is. Um, again, you can see in the at the in between the two small diagonal brands, you can see the old stent of 2005 and just proximal. Not look in this projection. Not looking a very severe lesion, actually, and some moderate disease distal. Um, so um, let me. Uh, okay, sorry, that went too fast. Um, the patient was, of course, treated um, with a direct stenting of, this, um, uh, of the intermediate branch, uh, sorry, of the ramus intermediate. Um, and um, this is the result, a good, good result, direct stenting, uh, quick and a good result with nice flow. And, um, and then my question to uh, Zolt and Gabor is, what would you do in this case? Case was at 6 p.m. Um, last week, Thursday. Um, no acute cases coming up, uh, but at 6 p.m., people want to go home. What would you do? Then it's um, it's a case of a successful primary PCI. The the patient has been treated for the parotid artery. There is no question that uh, it was an easy and quick and easy procedure with not too much contrast. And uh, although the LED does not look uh, very severe to me, it's a very proximal lesion. Uh, and we know that uh, almost 50% of the myocardium depends on that lesion. So um, um, we can come back to the discussion of a couple of minutes ago, uh, whether or not this patient needs to be fixed for this LED. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm sure that we need to know whether this LED lesion needs to be fixed. And if it was an easy procedure, why not just put a pressure wire and have uh, the exact answer on this question, whether this LED needs for vascularization or not. So I think I would, I would go on with measuring the FFR. And uh, if it was positive, I'd be, I tend to, to, to revascularize that in one go, or at least plan it within uh, a couple of weeks at most. So early on. So I can tell you what is the, uh, let's say the routine uh, in, in, uh, in our group. Uh, uh, there are indeed some cases when we go on immediately with, uh, with uh, the non-culprit vessels, but I would say more the routine is that, let's say if the patient is treated today, 6 p.m., that uh, not tomorrow, but the day after, so today is, but today is uh, um, Tuesday, so the second day after, uh, we do FFR guided for the non-culprit. So we do FFR guided for such lesions, clear, no question but we do normally on the second day uh, after, after the procedure. Why? It's not because we don't believe in um, ad hoc uh, FFR uh, assessment of this culprit, but simply the, um, the whole logistics of the cat lab and the department, uh, it speaks more for a uh, uh, very early second procedure. Okay, clear. Um, I I, I prefer to do the FFR as much as possible in, in the acute phase, because as already mentioned by Zolt, in, that in 30 to 50 percent of the cases of intermediate lesions or significant looking uh, and geographically significant looking lesions, you end up with ne the negative FFR. And only by measuring the FFR in the acute phase, you can really prevent in quite a lot of patients that they have to come back to your cat lab have another radial puncture, have to be exposed to, to anticoagulants and an and, and invasive procedure. Um, so I mean, really, if you're not wanting to do a complete visualization at index, it's, it, you could consider doing an FFR because it could prevent in a lot of cases, patients coming back to your cat lab. Uh, let me challenge you with a question, what I am challenged with quite often by, by fellows and colleagues. Both of your cases had uh, intermediate stenosis on the culprit vessel. In Jolt's case, if there was a lesion in the crooks of the RCA. Uh, Peter, in your case, one might argue that the ostium of the intermediate looks also so intermediate. When can you assess this? On the same day, a week later, in six months, never. 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, definitely, you you cannot assess that by FFR in the acute phase. Um, that is that is actually that will will not give you a reliable answer whether you should treat proximal or distal additional non culprit lesions. Um, in that case, I would I would only treat it on based on angio, but not FFR guided in the acute phase or in the subacute phase, even not. Actually. Um, uh, there are some studies. There is a study from uh, from Amsterdam, which specifically looked at at what stage is it uh, things become back to normal when you can do a reliable FFR. But that is weeks after um, and and not uh, days after. Would you agree me uh, with me? Uh, because my belief is that if you measure. And it's significant. Let's say in this your case, you measure the LED, you measure the circuit, so you have already the wire there. So if you measure and it's significant, then it will be clearly significant even afterwards. Even if it's non-significant, then you can trust. But I would, coming back to my case, you said that there was some lesion in the crux, which is true. And that may be thrombus, which may resolve with aptifibatide or whatever uh, antithrombotic medication you give. So I wouldn't measure FFR even for that matter. So of course we we are certain that the microvasculature is 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 badly hit by the STEMI. So we cannot trust uh, maximal hyperemia, which is of paramount importance for FFR. But on the other hand, we also may have some some lesions or some some uh, stenoses caused by something that will resolve within time or as time goes by. So I, I wouldn't uh, measure FFR in the carpet uh, artery during the acute phase. Of course, some days later, we have, we have some data from Bernard's group showing that six, six days after uh, or later uh, after the, the STEMI, it may be measured. And as a rule of thumb, I think we can, we can remember that the larger the infarction, the more time it takes for the microvasculature to recover completely and to have the reliable FFR measurement there. Um, so I, I think uh, I wouldn't measure, and I would use NGU just like Peter said for the, for the therapy of the, of the uh, infarcturator artery. You badly need something more than that, but FFR or physiology for that matter is probably not the way to go in the carpets. And uh, another important uh, aspect is that in the complete trial, there was no difference between the outcome of patients treated with a median of one day as compared with 23 days in their non corporates So I, uh, this is to, to say that, that Peter, I think, uh, is, is, is very right in that same thing that a third or half of the patients will not need uh, to come back for the diagnostic procedure, only for the therapeutic procedure, which can be avoided if you measure the FFR. Uh, acutely, and therefore, uh, it's in in some instances, in some environments, it may be beneficial to measure the FFR acutely in the non corporates and you know, come back, make the patient, make only the patient uh, patients come back who have positive FFRs. Because if you do the revascularization some weeks later, the patients will not uh, uh, say uh, have any any uh, uh, bad prognosis based on that. But uh, if you revascularize them within, say, uh, a month or, or, or six weeks or so. But measuring the FFR, yeah, it has this advantage of not needing to come back, which I think is quite important. And not doing a second procedure uh, unnecessarily is, is important. But honestly, the majority of our patients for, for logistic and, 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 uh, and financial reasons do have a second procedure, which we usually do FFR guided. So we do not treat all patients acutely in multivessel uh, by multivessel PCI. I That's would say here, closing the, the loop of different suggestions that we made here, uh, if you decide for a second procedure, probably you see the advantage of uh, assessing the culprit vessel a bit better than in the acute phase. So if there was some, some uncertainty in the culprit vessel, then uh, probably a few days later, you have a better view on this. On the other hand, I agree with Peter as well. If you assess all the non culprit vessels in the acute phase, then probably you don't need to bring back the patient at all. So let's see how you proceeded with your case. Good, good. Okay, there was a nice discussion. Um, well, I did FFR in the, of the postlateral branch in the same setting. Just as um, uh, Zolt did, we, uh, we, give inter we give 200 microgram analysis uh, intercoronary. You see here the, the, the result by with the options wire, um, 085. So 
no need to intervene in that uh, specific uh, vessel or lesion. Um, and then um, we proceed towards the LED. Um, a, a, you see the wire in the cranial uh, position, um, cranial view. Um, and in this case, the FFR um, was uh, borderline 0.80. Um, and that really is, yeah, then you could wonder, okay, what, um, what should we do? This is borderline. Um, should, we, should we investigate more or, well, what would you do? So it's would you like one. to take this on? <laughs> It's a tough one. And I'd like to remind the audience that FFR is not only uh, a qualitative matter, but it's also a quantitative matter. So we know that patients who have very low FFRs and go unrevascularized fare a much worse uh, prognosis as compared with ones like your case with an FFR of 0.80. I mean, if this was focal, if you can treat it focally, I think this patient will benefit. However, if there is a diffuse disease and if you need to embark on a, on a very long procedure with implanting multiple stents in the LED, uh, the most probable gain will be much less than that. So I think it's the focality that needs to be clarified in this case. And geographically, it, it looks quite focal, of course, but we also know that there is a disconnect between the angiographic and the physiologic focal or diffuseness of the disease. Yeah, I think exactly. it's, uh, you're completely right that uh, while we know uh, the risk continuum of of uh, ischemia in terms of FFR, what we don't know is actually the risk continuum of, uh, of, of the PCI that we can perform. So let's say if you have an 0.8 FFR and you know with it can, you, you, you see already that with a certain procedure, you can achieve a massive improvement in the ischemic burden of this territory, then I would definitely go for it. Okay, it's approximate so, LED, and that's something that the FFR does not take into consideration how much myocardium is dependent. It, it does take into, I'm, I'm sorry, to, uh, but it, it does not. So an, an FFR of 0.80 in a diagonal is uh, biologically different from uh, uh, the gain that you uh, remember, uh, that, you, uh, that you hope for in uh, revascularizing a proximal LED with an FFR of 0.80. So that's, again, something that you have to impute uh, so all these small bits, uh, the contrast load, the, the length of the procedure, radiation, and video procedures, and, and COVID, and, and, but also uh, the, the myocardium, and, and how much myocardium we are actually going to revascularize, and in what quality. So if it's a focal, uh, easy procedure with a large uh, delta FFR, large difference between pre and post FFR, I think we have good evidence to show that that uh, this is probably something beneficial for the patient. Okay, good. Um, can we go back to the presentation? Yeah, great. Um, so what I did is we we I wanted to have more reassurance on whether <clears throat> I should treat this patient or not for the LED, and if so, where I should treat the patient. So what we did was we uh, we, were, we went into the um, resting indices. We used the DPR um, mode from the from the options wire, and um, and we did a pullback uh, on the angio uh, um, on the fluoro, and um, and as you can see, um, the DPR was was highly significant and um, uh, to my surprise. And when we did the pullback, um, the biggest jump was exactly at the spot of the proximal part of the of the stent, just proximal of the stent. So that eccentric lesion in the LED was um, somehow the most flow limiting part within the LED. And uh, based on the DPR um, resting indices and also a little on the FFR of 0.80, we decided to treat this simple um, short uh, asymm asymmetric lesion. And um, we um, put there another uh, stent, um, drug eluting stent, seolumin eluting stent um, over there, uh, Post dilated, high pressure, and um, and had a nice angiographic result. Unfortunately, I forgot to measure the um, FFR all over again. That would be have that would have been interesting to see to show that exactly that um, DPR and FFR would would have gone better. Um, but um, I was already quite uh, um, satisfied with the result, and 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 the case over here. Um, 
the reason why resting indices and FVR can be a little bit different in the acute STEMI phase is potentially based by the fact that FFR might be marginally um, um, underestimate the severity in the acute phase, whereas IFR marginally overestimates um, the non-culprit lesions um, in non-infarct arteries. And the reason for why IFR is, or resting indices are overestimating is that by having more hyperkinesia of the non-infarct artery areas and a more, res more higher basal flow in the non-infarct arteries might give you a slightly overestimation um, at, um, at in the acute phase when you're doing measuring uh, with resting indices. And when you have, and, and for the same reasons you might have, uh, because of the uh, little bit edema in the in the in the in the in the border zone, and um, some facial constriction, you might have a little underestimation of your FFR um, in the acute phase of your non-infarct arteries. Uh, it's moderate. So if you have 0 0.80 at, at in the acute phase, and you do that same patient uh, two weeks later. Um, you might end up with maybe something like 0.78. Um, more often, a little bit lower than 0.8 than 0.8 or, or above. That's what I wanted to say. Um, and then um, well, um, it would be interesting to see um, if reimbursement really has an impact on our treatment of our patients. And indeed, um, we can see here nicely that if the FFR wire was reimbursed within the STEM procedure, a lot of, lot of you would, would change your strategy in treating multivessel STEM patients. That's very interesting to see. And, um, and, um, and also if complete visualization at STEMI was re higher reimbursed than infarct artery only. It's also interesting to see that these kind of things really, they, they really uh, those financial incentives we have to take into account. And I think we have still have a lot of work to do um, to make uh, to our policy makers and insurance companies that if we want to treat the patient as best as possible, um, we should also be rewarded for that, for our exercise and, 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 and also the, all, the, um, all the material used for the, during the procedure. Do you agree? Yeah, fully agree that, uh, that uh, indeed we discussed that uh, data are already there supporting that it's really reasonable to use uh, FFR guidance when we uh, decide for complete revascularization. What has to or can be optimized behind is the, uh, the logistics, the hospital logistics, and uh, last but not least, uh, the reimbursement. I think this is also... Uh, uh, a good final word because uh, we uh, already over discussed our our uh, nominated time for for this webinar. So I would just like to uh, put together everything what we discussed and thank you, Jord, and thank you, Peter, for 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 your cases and 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 also thanks for all the participants for for the questions. If we can just go to my slides briefly. Um, um, now, if we cannot go to my slides, then I just say it by words that uh, uh, I think we discussed the say that complete revascularization is, I would not say that the new standard, this should be the standard for patients with multivessel diseases, STEMI. FFR guidance is a reasonable approach, and, and data has shown that, that uh, it's, it's good enough if we revascularize the functionally significant stenosis and the functional non-significant stenosis can be left alone in the non-culprit territory. When to, when to do this on the same spot, um, on the same procedure staged or, or later staged is the matter of uh, logistics, is the matter of uh, reimbursement. There is definitely room for improvement here. So with these words, I would like to thank you again for all, all your talks. Thanks for, for Radcliffe and thanks for Opsons for the support. And I would like to remind all our participants that, um, that this webinar will be available on demand also later on. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening, everyone, and looking forward to meeting you one of the other webinars in the future.
Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.